Hey there, Internet. It's all good. Sam here. I'm uh, recreating a presentation uh, I gave at FBDM this weekend. I did record that presentation, and some of the slides were out of order. And my plan was to record it so that uh, Patreons uh, and possibly others could enjoy it. But um, I kind of decided I wanted to redo it again. So <laughs> I'm recreating it here. Um, it basically was just me talking to a group uh, with this slideshow. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to you and show you some slides. This first one is just my introduction, int introductory slide. I'm Sal Good Sam, SalGoodSam.com. These are my independent books. I've done many other books. I worked at Marvel and DC and Image and IDW and for a bunch of other play, uh, clients and places like Nelvana and Cinegroup and um, all over. I'm a professional artist. I've been at it for 30 years and uh, my personal specialty is comics and or sequential art. Sequential art being the fancy academic turd for comics, but also other media that uses similar devices. So storyboarding and children's books, and even in theory things like art curation could be described as sequential art. Sequential art just means uh, art in sequence giving a narrative. And in fact, I often use the modified version of the term sequential narrative art versus sequential non-narrative art, which is sort of abstract. So what I'm going to talk about in this discussion are the mechanics of sequential art and how to build narrative and how uh, juxtaposition, closure, page flow, all those things work. The title of the talk is Snakes and Ladders and Closure and the Mechanics of Sequential Art. Uh, just a few credits here. Uh, I teach a class at Sin Studio downtown Montreal called Making Comics with Sal Good Sam. And uh, this uh, audio and some of my tutoring is also available via Patreon. Uh, when I have images and uh, some of the things that I reference in this, uh, some of it uh, I generated the images myself, but there are images that I borrowed from Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics and Making Comics, and from Jessica Abel and Matt Maiden's Drawing with Words and Writing with Pictures. Uh, both of them should be duly credit. I will mention them when uh, we're looking at their work. They also are responsible for some of the lists that I'm presenting, uh, and uh, I've made my own modifications and everything, but credit where credit's due. You should go get those books if you want to learn about making comics. They are indispensable. Uh, I particularly recommend Drawing with Words and Writing with Pictures as a great starting point for any young person interested in making comics, or old person for that matter, just anyone new to the medium. Uh, making comics and understanding comics are also excellent. They're really intense and uh, uh, quite get into the nitty gritty of fine details. Um, and then also uh, Jessica Abel Matt Man had a follow-up book uh, uh, which I don't remember the title of just right now. I believe it's uh, Mastering Comics, that's what it was. Um, uh, that goes, follows up to the drawing with words and writing with pictures. Also excellent. Um, so, let's get on with it. So, one of the core mechanisms of sequential art is juxtaposition, which basically means putting two things together to create uh, a relationship between them. And in the context of comics, a third idea. So anytime you put words and pictures together, that creates juxtaposition. When there's transitions between panels, that creates juxtaposition. I believe Scott McCloud coined the term closure to describe what happens in the moments between two things that create juxtaposition. So he was usually talking about uh, what happens in the gutters between panels in a comic. But I think the idea is that sort of anything that sort of bookends an idea creates a moment of closure. So. For as an example, I've got this drawing of an apple that I did here. It's a fairly realistic apple. It's obviously not a picture of an apple, a photo of an apple. It's a representation of an apple. So it's fairly literal. It's not the apple or a particular apple. It's a drawing of an apple. That makes it already a bit of an idea. Uh, it's not abstracted, but it's actually a little more abstracted than a photograph. It's representational. Um, an apple has cultural connotations. In the West, some of the ideas that might come to mind are food, knowledge, temptation, New York, one a day keeps the doctor away, or gravity. Uh, there are some people who might think of those things right away when they see this sketchy, somewhat realistic drawing of an apple, but because it's a semi-realistic apple, probably they didn't jump to mind. Mostly you probably looked at it and said, oh, it's an apple. But if I put the words that I just mentioned below the apple, now I'm creating a moment of juxtaposition between a picture and a set of words or a single word. And that bookends an idea or creates what I would call a moment of closure 
as Scott McCloud described it, uh, between, in this case, words or a word and a picture. It's fairly effective, uh, even though none of these images strongly, iconically represents any of these ideas. They all reference something that, if you are aware of the cultural uh, connotations, will immediately come to mind. So here we have a bunch of different apples. It's actually one drawing of another apple, but cartoonily. So it's a cartoon of an apple. Um, the cartoon factor distances us from that literal representation of an apple. It's no longer so specific. It is now a symbol of an apple, an icon. And so we are moving more towards the abstraction of an idea. And that's one of the jobs that cartooning and comics often does. You can do very realistic comics. Uh, but one of the powers of cartooning, so the reason why, for example, Charlie Brown is so effective as a very simple cartoon, is he's the idea of a kid, not a particular kid. He's got a strong personality in the sense that we're all familiar with Charlie Brown is, but he's really kind of an avatar for a persona, a personality. Uh, he can be related to easily. There's an argument that because he's so simply drawn that people can, can project themselves onto him. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I think we can definitely project onto him our idea about who he is. Not so much that we would put him on as a mask, but for certain, uh, he is not so defined and so specific that he feels like a specific other person. He feels like an avatar for a set of ideas. And so when you play with cartooning, you are juxtaposing words and pictures, but you're abstracting the picture just enough that you're opening up even more possibilities for the connotations. So now, notice that I've handwritten all of these pieces of text. They're a lot like comics lettering. It's basically my comics lettering is what we're looking at. And one of the reasons I recommend comics lettering, why you generally see either handwritten comics lettering or fonts that look like handwriting, is that they have a similar kind of uh, difference in reading from, say, a font, say, Times New Roman or Helvetica. You could use those in lettering a comic, but the reality is that they are a little impersonal and kind of cold and mechanical, and they don't have any warmth. And a hand-drawn drawing tends to have more warmth than if you've got this weird cold lettering with a ha uh, real warm uh, uh, drawing. It it doesn't settle as well. The juxtaposition is sort of jarring. It doesn't work as well. So hand lettering is frequently used to create a more sympathetic relationship between the image and the word. Um, it blends with the art on the page a lot better than a really cold font. And in the end, even the, those fonts that do a really good job of simulating hand lettering, yeah, if you, if you really put them right next to a handwritten lettering, so actual handwriting uh, 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 or handwritten comics lettering isn't actually a font, it's, it's lettering. Uh, that Sometimes it's hard to tell those really good fonts apart, and they'll even make a point of having alternate versions of the letters so they don't totally repl replicate when there's multiple T's, like in Temptation, or two P's in Apple, you can have two different P's. Uh, but still, they have a sort of mechanical perfection about them and uh, a sameness. And so a lot of times, even when, with my own hand lettering, I kind of avoid when I'm doing it by hand, being too perfect and uptight about it, I like that even extra bit of organicness. I go, I lean the other way. Uh, but sort of the whole point of those uh, faux hand lettered looking fonts is to maintain that warmth. But what happens when we switch to uh, what's called a display font, something more iconic, something more a little logo like? So now we're starting to move towards what is recognized as a logo. So we have that iconic uh, symbolic version of an apple. And now we have a font that in self, itself helps embody some of the ideas that we're referencing. So there's the sciency version of gravity and the Helvetica notion of apple and temptation written in a biblical font and a, a, a versus the more, again, sciency looking, futuristic looking uh, knowledge. One a day in a kind of Dr. Scrawl cartoony font, not an apple in a, a cursive script. Uh, New York in a, it kind of looks like a typewriter font. Kind of has that New York, New York feel. So this is where we're moving towards increasing iconography. Uh, it becomes increasingly symbolic. Even the text is, is, is hearkening to a symbolic or uh, uh, and a subtext in its presentation as a, as a display font. And we can finish that journey by looking at the things I'm referencing. So uh, icon for the Apple logo, a biblical reference of uh, the snake offering an apple, Newton getting hit in the head with an apple, a, do a teacher being hand offered an apple, Macrete's This Is Not an Apple painting, uh, reference to the Treachery of Images series that he did. Uh, I love New York, and of course, eat 
an apple and keep the doctor away? Probably not really, but it's a healthy practice. So here are some images. It comes from drawing with words, writing with pictures. They're examples of interesting uses of juxtapositions of words and pictures that creates this sort of subtext. So we have the shady image of a man creeping on a woman saying, I have no political agenda, right, by David Masicelli. And the subtext there that we get right away is he's got some kind of agenda. It might even be political, but we suspect what kind it is. And it's really overt. It's, it's right there staring you in the face. But it's actually not. It's pantomime, and the pantomime is echoed and under, underlined and enforced by a complimentary, ironic statement in text. And notice it's in small lower caps, uh, which kind of interestingly makes it understated. By contrast, we have uh, Sam Henderson's uh, funny cartoon here. Uh, again, so you guys yelling, so it's all caps. It's a, a bit of a goofy display font, uh, or sorry, just a display lettering text. And he's saying, uh, it's always gimme, gimme, gimme with you people. And of course, he has all the eyes, right? So contrast of image and pictures. Uh, here we have Newton about to be hit in the head. And it says, I don't think you understand the gravity of the situation. And a, a cartoon from an old newspaper uh, I believe it's like a classic cartoon uh, called Breaking It Gently. He, I thought we were engaged. She, we were. It's very subtle. I love the drawing. Cute. So these are all about, f uh, these are all examples of, of good clarity. A strong choice of moment, a choice of frame, choice of image, choice of word, and choice of flow. This is a, a chart from Scott McCloud's uh, Making Comics. And under that, you'll see a bunch of subheadings, uh, what the goals are for each, and the tools that you apply. But for the moment, I want you to just focus on the headings, which is so you're thinking about your moment that's going to be in each frame, how you're going to frame it, uh, what the image you're focusing on in that frame, the words that go with it. Something that's often underserved in comics is uh, your choice of words. And even I like to teach uh, using poetry in my class because it makes people really think about their use of words. And then choice of flow, that's the relationship between frames on, on the page and how you move through the comics page. These are the key decisions you need to make when you're making a comic. Um, so there are the choice of moment and uh, image and frame all relates to, and choice of word, all relates to uh, these kind of picture word combination styles. Again, this is from uh, Making Comics. And here he's got a great list. The seventh one I, I quibble with a little bit, but let's focus on the first six. Uh, word specific. Uh, so we have a relationship between the words and the picture that are uh, complimentary and some of the words reflect what we're seeing. Miranda gave me the keys and smiled and we see a, a very friendly smile. There's a lot of subtext and connotations there. We could read it a few ways. Uh, there's certainly sort of a, a double entendre implication of someone like flirting, maybe it's hotel keys. It could just be a friendly coworker giving the keys. It can be read a few ways, but it, it definitely suggests a, a friendly, familiar relationship. And the words are echoing what we see and drawing focus on what are the, in, the important parts of the words. So we don't see her hand putting keys in, in the person's hand, we just see the smile. And that sort of suggests where the focus is. So it's word specific, but with a particular focus being drawn. Uh, picture specific, we have two moments, uh, a moment of closure between a before and after. He's swinging and he's done it. He hit the ball and the words say he did it. So we know he didn't miss the ball. He could have, it might have swooped by, but the he did it emphasizes the outcome. It tells us how to interpret these pictures. So that's picture specific. Uh, duo specific is a funny one and I like to point it out as something that people usually do at the beginning of making comics. It's the least nuanced comics with words and pictures though because it's sort of didactic and self-repetitive. So he jabbed his finger. Ah, I jabbed my finger at you as the guy jabs his finger at us. Everything is repeating everything else. It's, it's doubling down and tripling down on the same message. Uh, you can do this. It tends to be kind of more effective as a humorous over-the-top thing or if you really need to emphasize something intensely. Uh, otherwise, it's not the most subtle way to tell, do things with words and pictures. Uh, it's one of those moments where having somebody say something that isn't, I jab my finger at you, but what they're accusing them of, and jabbing the finger is all you need. And then if you really needed to get a caption, it should be something about, you know, how you felt about this person losing their losing it on you. Intersecting words and pictures. Now this is getting a little more subtle by contrast. How do you like my new threads, baby? And then his new threads are really tacky. He's got dollar signs and looks like a paisley pattern happening. 
and he's a bit of a slick guy with a pencil mustache. So words and pictures working together in some respects while also contributing information independently. The, they both bring in different ideas, and those different ideas clash and suggest new ideas again. Uh, all the previous ones we looked at, the picture specific, we're pretty much seeing what's happening and we're being clearly directed at how to interpret it. Word specific, there are some connotations, but you're basically being shown where the emphasis is in the words. And do specific is pretty, pretty literal. Intersecting is where you start getting into juxtaposition within the panel that's really subtle and actually opens up new ideas. So we're, we're, what's implied here is subtext about who's speaking and what they're like. Uh, interdependent, words and pictures combining to convey an idea that neither would convey alone. So the woman says, I'm so happy with you, but in the picture, she's holding her neck, she's crying, and she's talking on the phone. So we know some things that are just implied here without being said. The person she's talking to can't see her. Uh, we could infer that she is attempting to be sincere, and so I'm so happy for you might be n intended to be read as genuine, but in fact we can see that she's not happy. Right? It could be tears of joy, but those that expressional expression doesn't look like joy, so it looks like distress. And so we have subtext and backstory and drama layered in through the pantomime and the, the words offsetting against each other. They both have, tell a d conflicting stories, and the end result is an idea that's not explicit. It's implied and subtext. Now even more subtextual, and kind of abstract even, are parallel. Number six here is parallel. Words and pictures following seemingly different paths without intersecting. But they will, because that's the way juxtaposition works. The readers will imply, not imply, infer in your head, in their heads, that something is happening. There's a story. So don't forget the dog food, somebody said, some quotation marks in a caption box. Well, we look at a picture of someone on a horse by the pyramids at night. So did they get lost? What happened? You start asking questions, and you will write a story in your head. You might be not sure what it is, but you're being invited to kind of write a story and, and imagine something. Uh, it made me laugh. It's, it's, when I present this at talks, people always get a chuckle out of this. This is a, a very clever panel that Scott McCloud came up with. Um, it's an excellent example of parallel narratives that actually fill a blank space full of ideas. Um, and the fun thing about that blank space full of ideas is that as an author, if you do this, you're not the one filling it. You're creating two strongly charged parallel notions. And that blank space, that's a moment of juxtaposition happening in the reader's mind. And it's going to be filled with all of their social and cultural baggage and connotations. They're the ones that are going to come up with the narrative. It's it's less controlled kind of form of storytelling. Uh, you can't totally determine how people will read that sort of thing. But it's also one of the richest, because in the end, even the best writer in the world isn't really as good as the unguarded imagination of your average human being. So just priming them with some fun, creative stuff like that. Uh, intersection, independent, and parallel all take advantage of your reader's imagination to kind of read into things more. Word specific can, at least the example here does. Uh, the, the other two, less so, they're kind of explicit. Um, and I always find, like, you know, explicit storytelling in comics is, can work. It's not horrible, but the most powerful and, and persuasive and evocative stuff is the more implicit and the stuff that invites the reader to interpret. So last one here, montage. Basically, the words are now part of the art. They're environmental. They're uh, uh, giving us a sense of how this person feels about the space. And along with the pantomime of this cartoon character, uh, the combination here tells us a lot about what's happening. It's it's a I'm not sure if it's a combination style because I think the words are the art here. So that's why I say I quibble with it. It's it's but it is technically their words. Um, it could be sound effects as well. I think you know uh, designed uh, sound effects that have kind of an, uh, in themselves the way they're designed a, a shape that invokes the sound does a similar thing. So you have sound being drawn as letters in the panel. Um, so if you just print, boom, with a dull lettering, it doesn't really feel like a boom, but if you have this interesting, uh, intense hand-drawn or uh, display font that really feels like an explosion, that's uh, sort of the similar kind of effect as this. Okay, that's it for part one. Hope you're enjoying this. Part two starts getting into transitions between panels, the juxtaposition between each panel and the comic page and how that works. Uh, by the way, the unedited version of this is an hour and 26 minutes long, so there's an uncut version 
posted on Patreon. Go check that out at patreon.com slash salgood and look for the link in the doobly-doo. Or you can look for the link for the next part here on YouTube. Um, links to all the sources I mentioned and everything are also in the description text, so check that out in the doobly-doo. And I'll see you in the next clip, YouTube. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe by hitting subscribe, and that way you'll get all of my videos when I post them. Uh, even better, pledge on Patreon, and uh, you'll get even more.